Psalms 137, we'll begin reading verse number 1. The Bible says, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy, remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. Let's pray. Our Father, we bless you. We thank you for the good singing. We're thankful you are alive forevermore. You have the keys to death and hell. You're he that was alive and that died and that rose again, and you're alive forevermore. You're our great high priest. You're our intercessor. You're our Lord. You are the King of glory, and we certainly bless your holy name. Now, fathers, we come to you tonight in prayer. We do pray for our church family during these uh, trying times that you would uh, uh, comfort them. You would uh, put a hedge about them. You would undergird them. You would sustain them. Uh, uh, even where they are tonight. I do pray for our country. I pray for our president, our leaders. You'd give them wisdom. I do pray for those that are sick. I'm thankful, Lord, that uh, uh, they're starting to come out with statistics of how many are recovering, and that's a blessing. And we're thankful that, uh, Lord, there are folks that uh, are not uh, fatalities uh, as a result of this virus, but they are uh, being recovered. And God, we do pray. Uh, Lord, for our evangelists, Lord, during these trying times, losing meeting and losing money, I pray you'd sustain them and help them. Our missionaries, the same. I pray for our uh, sister churches, you'd bless them. It's difficult on all of us. And Lord, uh, when our freedoms and our rights have been taken away, and God, we're having to use uh, other means to be able to preach the Word of God. But God, do, we do thank you that, Lord, we are still able to preach the Word of God. Now, Father, bless these that uh, got to be here tonight. Bless those that are watching or listening. And, Father, certainly I pray you'd get glory to your glorious name. I pray through all of this that, Lord, somebody will come to the saving knowledge of Christ. And I do pray that folks would be helped. Now, Father, help us this night. Use this unworthy vessel. We'll thank you for it. For it's in the wonderful and holy and resurrected Savior's name that we do pray. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. I want to draw your attention to several things from this psalm as a way of introduction. I want you to notice that Israel is in bondage. In verse number one, it says, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. They were no longer in their homeland. They were in Jerusalem. They were in Babylon. They were being held captive. They were now slaves to a pagan king. Now, friends, they were there because of their own doing. Uh, the Lord raised up prophet after prophet, preached to them to repent and uh, put God first in their life, uh, 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 to do away with their pagan gods and to do away with uh, their rituals and get back to serving God. Uh, and uh, Jeremiah told them, get to the old paths and walk therein. That was a good way. They said, we will not walk therein. Uh, and as a result, uh, uh, they were taken captive, and now many of them uh, 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 are away from their homeland. Others uh, have uh, been slaughtered and killed. Uh, and uh, while they're in this uh, 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 place called Babylon, this place of bondage, uh, we see they have uh, no joy. They have no thrills in their life. It says they sat down by the rivers. In other words, they're giving up. And can I say, even as we're here tonight, many of us feel like we're in bondage. Uh, we have had our rights taken from us. We can't assemble like we have all of our lives and all throughout the history of the United States of America uh, because of the choice of a few that 
think they know what's best for the masses and they deem what is essential and what is not essential and in their minds church is not essential uh, but to you and I that are believers uh, you and I that uh, 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 follow after the Lord and take up our cross uh, uh, to you and I church is more than essential it's vital for uh, our very existence and mm, they don't know the Lord or they wouldn't know why it is it's amazing even this week our governor is going to let prisoners out of jail but he will arrest Christians for assembling in the house of God oh how we live in wicked times but can I say we too are here because we have ignored the preaching of the word of God for years this Bible's been preached and for years uh, God has warned his children about being complacent uh, and about taking him for granted uh, and for years people blow in the house of God blow out uh, uh, forgetting the messages they've heard not heeded to it uh, 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 they have been Christian in name only uh, they haven't truly sold out and served God and now you won't miss the water till the well runs dry we see them in bondage I want you to notice they're broken. Look what it says in verse number 1. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. I'm praying that while we are having to do this, it would actually break us to where we once again appreciate the house of God. We appreciate the God of the house of God. We appreciate the Word of God we truly get broken for the things of God. We get broken for God himself. I pray that that is what will be the result of this. I fear, though, that many won't allow to affect them at all. I fear that many will get used to not being in church, and then they'll have another excuse not to be once the doors are opened again. I shudder to think how many of our church family that are not even tuning in right now because it's not that important to them. Uh, we see Israel is in bondage. We see Israel is broken. But can I say Israel is also bruised. Look what verse number 2 says. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. Now I'm not a rocket scientist, but a harp was meant to be played. And they'd play it to sing. A harp's not meant to be hanging in a tree. But you see, Israel has become bruised. They no longer feel like they have a song to sing. And I say through their captivity, they have become downtrodden. If you're not careful... All the course of events going on will cause you to get down. I find myself watching and listening and looking for a little ray of hope of when all this will end. Many of you said, Preacher, when are we going to get back to normal? I don't have a, a crystal ball. I don't have one of them magic eight balls that's going to tell me what's going on. I'm in the same boat you are. I just don't know. Could I say they not only got downtrodden, they got defeated. If you're not careful, all this going on will cause you to become oppressed and you'll get defeated. And they even became depressed. I don't know about you, but I have found myself fighting the very spirit of depression because it is hard for me to come and preach to a church house that's not full. It's hard for me to preach imagining you being there and you not there. It's hard for me to seek for answers and everything knowing that tonight's not going to be any different than Sunday night. This coming Lord's Day won't be any different than tonight. Just ten people in the building. It'll cause you to get depressed knowing you can't go out and invite folks to church knowing that for the first time in the history of America, we will not be able to have services on Easter. It's depressing, especially when you know a lot of what we're being told is fabricated. 
It's depressing. I hate that there are people who have died. But even the doctors who are on TV at every press conference with the president have admitted anybody that even showed symptoms of coronavirus, they have been designated a coronavirus death. It amazes me, the number one killer of America is heart disease. And heart attacks have went way down as a cause of death because of coronavirus. Many of these death certificates are nothing more than people having heart attacks. Oh, they may have had this virus, they may have had the flu, they may have had pneumonia, may have had bronchitis, but they died of heart disease. But it's listed as this because they're padding their stats because they have to justify why they've shut the economy down. I don't know about you, but that depresses me to see the America that I've known and loved not to be the America, that, that America here today. We see that Israel's in bondage. They're broken. They're bruised. But then we find Israel being belittled. Look at verse 3. For there, where? The rivers of Babylon. They that carried us away captive require of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. They hung their harps on the willows because those that were their taskmasters, those that were the slave drivers, uh, uh, were belittling them, wanting them to sing them a song. They were making fun of them and their God. Can I say? Everybody that says we got live stream and we don't need to assemble, they're making fun of us and they're making fun of our God. The Bible says that where two or three are gathered together in his name, he'd be in the midst. The Bible says that not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together so much more as you see the day approaching. Uh, uh, the Bible commands us to assemble. Uh, our conscience towards God commands us to assemble. Uh, 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 our freedoms under the Constitution allows us to assemble. Yet, they belittle us saying this isn't that important. It's non-essential. And I say... Being belittled is being bullied. And some of these wicked politicians, wicked governors, and by the way, that's who's holding up the economy, the governors. They're bullying God's people, not allowing us to worship. Can I say this? Israel in this psalm is burdensome. Look at verse number 4. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Every person, or not every person, but every service we've had this way, they'll ask, are we going to have congregational singing? Why? We don't have a congregation. How can we sing the Lord's song in this strange environment? How can we really have church in this environment? We can't have an altar call. We can't take up an offering. That's a form of worship too. You see, all this is a strange land to us and yet they think we can just go ahead and worship well maybe crossroads can't because they don't have the true and living God but we as God's people know what the Bible says about worship and I say this it's burdensome not being able to worship you know one statistic that you're not reporting is the rise of suicides the rise of uh, the neglect of children, the children being abused. The so parents aren't used to dealing with them 24-7. All kinds of things going on that are affecting people's psyche and people's uh, uh, disposition because they can't leave their house. They can't go out. In some parts of the country, if you're caught without a mask, you get fined $1,000. Uh, they arrested a man playing t-ball with his little girl in an empty park the other night, handcuffed him in front of his daughter because he had the audacity of being closer than six feet to his own daughter. You hear all that and it burdens you when you realize we're no longer the land of the free and the home of the brave we're living in a police state we're living in a land where those we've elected to do right by us are doing wrong by us now notice Israel's bias or their mindset look at verse 5 
They said, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. Let my right hand forget what she's able to do and what she's able to perform and overcome. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Their mindset is, even though we're in bondage, we're not going to forget where we came from and whose we are. And God help us to not forget whose we are. And then notice their boost. What gave them some hope? What drove them to continue on? Look what it says in verse uh, number 7. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem who said, Raise it, raise it, even to the foundations thereof. Now here's their drive. Here's what uh, sustains them. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be, the Lord, that rewarded thee as thou hast served us. Remember what the Bible says. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Nobody picks on God's youngins and get away, gets away with it. Verse number 9, Happy shall he be, the Lord, that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. They may think we're non-essential. There's coming a day when they'll see how essential we really are. And oh, happy day that will be. Well, in reading this psalm and in looking for some direction from the Lord for tonight, I can envision Israel in this state of bondage, and we know from history it lasted 70 years. I can envision in Israel wondering if the bondage would ever end. And so I want to preach for just a few minutes on this thought. When a trial seems terminal. When a trial seems terminal. Now we know those songs. God will take this trial, make it a blessing. Thank God for that. Amen. We know that we grow in the valley. And we know that he's the lily of the valley. We know that man's days are few and full of trouble. We understand those verses and we quote those verses and some of us have had to live those verses, but yet sometimes it seems like the trial is greater than other things that we face and we wonder if this is the very trial that's going to take us out. Is this the trial that's terminal? Is it ever going to end? Well, I got to thinking when the trial seems terminal, when you don't know what tomorrow brings when you don't know if it's going to end if you don't know when we're going to be able to assemble again and worship again you don't know when you're going to get back to work you don't know when they're going to have toilet paper again on the, in the shelves and bless God hand sanitizer and things uh, Lysol and stuff that you can't find anymore uh, I wonder if it's ever going back to normal well, here's some things to consider when your trial seems terminal first of all you must manage the essentials you must manage the essentials. There are certain things that God holds us responsible for that he has given into our watch care that we must maintain. Uh, I remember when he gave uh, uh, the parable of the talents, when he gave one servant ten talents, one five talents, one, one talent. He said, occupy till I come. And can I say, my dear friends, that word occupy means to follow in the business of. Uh, uh, and until the Lord came back, there was some certain things they were expected to do. And you know, the one had ten, and best he had twenty, and one had five, came ten. One had one, went and buried it. He didn't cultivate it. And then when the master showed up, he took it away and gave it to the one that had the more talents. And why I say all that is, there are certain things we must cultivate. God has made us kings and priests for a reason, and there are some things that we are responsible to God for. We must cultivate, first of all, our time in prayer. Don't depend on somebody else pray for you. You are to have a prayer life. It is essential in your life. You're to manage the essentials. Uh, 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 you are to make certain you have a prayer life that is being effective. You are to cultivate your prayer life. Can I say this? We must cultivate the truth being sown in our hearts. 
It's one thing to listen to messages. It's another thing to get in the book and get a message. Uh, get some hope from God. Uh, uh, let the Word of God be sown in your heart. That is your responsibility. The psalmist uh, uh, David said in Psalm 119 verse 11, You know it well, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Uh, in uh, verse 114 of the same chapter, he says, Thou art my hiding place uh, and my shield. I hope in thy word. Uh, uh, we must make Manage the essentials, those things that God expects us to do. Uh, we must cultivate our prayer life. Uh, we must cultivate the truth being sown in our hearts. Uh, if you don't spend time in prayer, if you don't have the truth in your heart, uh, you, my friend, may not make it through the trial. You may be a statistic yourself. Brother Randy and I was talking for service, and I mentioned this before we were shut down. The danger of live stream services, there are some people who will like it, usually millennials. They do everything on their phones anyway. They'll get used to not being around the house of God, and they'll think, well, I can do this all the time. I know folks that will live stream, and I've heard of folks that will watch the live stream, and then they beat everybody to the restaurant. There are a lot of folks, this will become a way of life for them. It was never intended to be. You need to manage the essentials. If you don't spend time in prayer and you don't spend time sowing the truth in your heart, you'll follow after some new fangled thing too. I remember Brother Greg preaching the curse of modern technology. Well, we're going to find out how big a curse it really is. Do you realize if we did not have the capability of live stream, they could not shut us down, we'd still be assembling? That is the very hinge that they've got that says, no, you still have an avenue to worship, even though this isn't worship. In their eyes, it is. And every lawyer that, that talks about it says, is, you know, because we do have live stream, we can be classified as non-essential. If we didn't have this technology, we'd all be sitting here tonight. Think about it. You need to manage the essentials. You must... Cultivate your time in prayer. Cultivate the truth being sown in your hearts. We must cultivate our trust in the Lord, our faith. Where does our faith come from? The Scriptures. We must build ourselves up on our most holy faith. Because my dear friends, if not, fear starts creeping in. And fear is a real thing, and it will control you. It is controlling our nation right now. People that do not know God or people that have little faith... They're scared to death to go outside their homes. Some places are talking about finding people in their cars. This thing has absolutely scared people to death. I said it from day one. I'll say it again tonight. They've even said it's the same thing as uh, uh, that in... 145 flu it's the flu that's all it is it's got the same uh, strains instead of a bird it came from a bat both of them are nasty and fly around in the air huh but you've got to maintain your essentials you must cultivate your trust in the Lord if you do not build yourself up on your most holy faith you can't grab the coattails of somebody else and lean on their faith you must maintain the essentials. You must cultivate your testimony before others. There's never been a time that we've not been under more scrutiny than we are right now. Your relatives, your co-workers, your neighbors, they want to see if what you've got is real. Now's the time to prove it. Hmm. I appreciate the president not wearing a mask. They questioned him about that. I said, why aren't you wearing a mask? I'm not wearing one. Hmm. You know what he's saying? He's saying, it ain't going to help. I'm just going to be who I am. Well, we need to be Christian. That's who we are. And they need to see our faith. When a trial seems terminal, you must manage the essentials. Can I say, secondly, you must minimize the non-essentials. There are some things that are out of our control. You know what you need to do? Quit trying to control them. It's out of your control. You can't change it. You can't help it. You can't do anything about it. That's why I agreed to go to this. 
I could not control the situation of what the governor and the health department was going to bring on us. You've got to let go of things you cannot control. You've got to minimize the non-essential. There are some things you cannot change. You can hope, you can wish, you can uh, uh, do all kinds of things, hoping it changes, but it will not change. I mean, the Lord's in control. Let him have the things that are out of your control. I've said it a million times. He expects us to do what we can, manage the essentials, and then he'll do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. The non-essentials that we can't do, God can handle. I promise you one thing. It's not going to be over till God says it's over. We must manage the essentials, minimize the non-essentials. Can I say thirdly? You must strive for the mind of Christ. The Bible says in Philippians 2, 5, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and met, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We want to strive for the mindset of Christ. Just be a servant to God. Getting back to that minimizing the non-essentials, uh, a lot of folks worrying about whether or not their job's going to lay them off. Folks worrying about uh, 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 this and worrying about that. You're not going to be able to change it. So let God have that. Take on the mind of Christ and just make uh, 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 yourself a servant to God and humble yourself before God and say, God, I'm in your hands. Thy will be done. Job said this in Job 13, 15, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But I will maintain mine own ways before him. You see, my dear friends, when you strive for the mind of Christ, you yield yourself to the will of God. And until God makes his will known, you will maintain your ways before God. And I say this, when your trials seem terminal, you must meditate on virtuous things. Man, right now your mind can get jacked up real easy. There's so much uncertainty going on. So many false things being reported. You don't know what to believe or who to believe. Well, I can tell you who to believe. His name is Jesus. Paul said in Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Boy, how much better would our lives be? We would not be faced with oppression or depression if we'd take that verse to heart and we just meditate on virtuous things. I've tried to, when I uh, felt the spirit of oppression coming on me these days, I've tried to find something from God to meditate on. And I found that whether it be in prayer, whether it be reading the Bible or listening to a good song about the Lord, that spirit of oppression flees when I meditate on virtuous things. I thought about this. During these times, we don't know when it will end. You must measure your wealth. The old hymn writers have said it like this. Count your blessings... Name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. True Christian's wealth is not found in the wealth of this world. It's found in Christ. And when you start counting and measuring your wealth, and you start counting your family and what God's blessed you with, a good family, and you start counting uh, 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 how God has sustained you and how God has taken care of you. Uh, isn't it amazing when folks don't have as much money as they once did? Uh, the price of gas has come down about a buck thirty gallon. I say hallelujah, what a blessing. Uh, I'm trying to get a tank put it in my backyard and fill it up so when it goes back up to three bucks a gallon I'll have gas. Uh, yeah, good luck getting those permits, huh? But hey, you don't have to look around too much to see how good God's been to you. And when your trial seems terminal, you quit looking at the, at the bad things and start measuring the good things God's put in your life. You overcome evil with good. And how do you do that? You measure how good God's been to you. But Tony, it's been eight, nine years since you've worked. 
It ought to have been good to you. Every need supplied. That's how God is. When we start measuring those things and the things that are truly valuable, the things that are truly precious, my dear friends, that spirit of oppression will leave. Hmm? Matter of fact, you'll kind of be like them three Hebrews. You're in the fire, but you don't feel like you're in the fire. You're in the presence of God, and it's all good. Hmm? I've challenged people for years when things get tough, when you start counting them blessings, get you out a, a, a yellow ruled piece of paper and write pros and cons and start writing them pros down of everything God's been good to you. Before you get to number 10, you'll be shouting, and the rest of it don't matter. Hmm? You start seeing really how good God is to you and I. Thought about this, though. So. When terminal, your trial seems like it's terminal, you must malign apathy. You must resist becoming apathetic. Dangerous times right now. We're not assembling. We're not gaining strength from seeing our Christian brothers and sisters. We're not in the presence of God uh, uh, and enjoying the, the, the wonderful spirit of God like we're accustomed to. If you're not careful... Apathy will start creeping in. Job 1 says this, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, one that feared God. And here it is, and eschewed evil. He hated every false way. Well, that's why we ought to be when it comes to apathy. We ought to hate apathy. And as soon as we feel like we start getting cold towards God, we ought to hate that. We ought to run back to God. And get it taken care of. The psalmist said in uh, Psalm 119, 104, Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. If we're uh, managing the essentials and we're being in the Bible and being on our knees and doing those things we're supposed to do, apathy is not easily attained in your life. But if you start loosening up, apathy comes roaring like a lion. Can I say apathy causes complacency? That's where I fear that folks who get used to just watching these services and that becomes normal in their life. They become complacent. Because, you know, whether you're watching or not, nobody knows. You're not accountable. And yet, as Christians, we are fitly framed together and we are accountable one to the other. Hmm. Why do you think the Bible says some, someone that's been caught in sin that you rebuke them for all that others may see and fear? Because there's accountability. But yet, when you just turn the switch on and off, there's no accountability. Complacency starts setting in, and that's why we're where we are today. People started taking for granted the things of God started taking for granted we'll always have church even though we've preached on it years gone by we've preached on preached on preached on and yet people just thought we'd always be here people think brother Doug's always going to have a message friends we don't know what a day brings forth we must malign apathy apathy causes complacency where we just take for granted the things of God take for granted your health till your health's gone Take for granted your job till your job's gone. Take for granted Kroger's going to have food till they don't have food or to toilet paper. Huh? Can I say? Apathy causes complacency. Apathy causes confusion. We know the Bible says God is not the author of confusion in 1 Corinthians chapter number 14. But yet, we live in confusing times. People are confused. Hmm. Even through some of the announcements that I've made about not being able to have church in the parking lot you know, because of the rules. And hmm, By the way, the mayor of Louisville has absolutely stopped churches from having drive-in church where people could drive in, open their windows, and people out there with a bullhorn or sound system preach to them. Uh, that's in Louisville. Well, if it's in Louisville, it'll be here. Where do you think that reporter came from that was here a couple Sundays ago? Louisville. Hmm? I'm telling you, there's a lot of people who think they got all the answers. Well, nobody's got any answers right now but the Lord. Amen. And, and, you know, I certainly appreciate people having opinions and people having 
uh, insights and want to do things and want to assemble and all that, but can I help you with something? There's a lot of logistical problems to a lot of different things right now. There's a lot of confusion. People have actually got upset because I've mentioned we can't do this or we can't do that. Get upset. Get upset at the preacher. Well, I'm sorry you got upset. Get upset at the governor. He's one done it all. Not only does apathy cause complacency and confusion, but apathy causes corruption. These goofy, no good governors are letting criminals out and they're wondering why crime is going to spike. California, they're closing gun stores and letting criminals out and they wonder why crime's going to increase. Apathy causes corruption. Just like when you got a child that's unruly and you never discipline that child, that child's going to grow up and be a heathen. And don't blame the school teachers, don't blame the preacher, don't blame, you know, the laws, don't blame, blame mom and dad. That's who didn't correct them. Well, when we don't take care of apathy, apathy leads to sin, corruption. Let me say this lastly. When trials seem terminal, there's some things we must do or else we'll just fall by the wayside. Everyone must give an account of himself to God. We must maintain hope. I'm still maintaining this thing's going to get over sooner rather than later. Even though we stand against Nancy Pelosi, we voted in a governor that's following all of her legislation and ideologies. I still have hope in God, not the governor. The Bible says in Titus 2, 3, looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. Can I say Jesus went through all the torture of the cross that he might redeem some folks, and friends, we may be going through this that many might come to Christ. Consider those things lest you faint, be wearied in your minds. Uh, and then Isaiah 14, 3, I love this verse. And it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve. I'm glad there's coming a day it's going to come to pass. Do you know 133 times in your Bible you'll find that terminology that it came to pass or that it will come to pass? And I'm glad, hallelujah, it didn't come to stay. It'll come to pass. Your trial may seem terminal, but one day, friend, the trial's going to end and Jesus will be glorified. I found this poem. I want to read it to you. It's entitled, Don't Quit. When things go wrong, as sometimes they will, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high, and when you want to smile but you have to sigh, when care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. Life is queer with its twists and turns, as every one of us sometimes learns, and many a failure turns about when he might have won if he'd have stuck it out. Don't give up. Though the pace seems slow, you may succeed with another blow. Often the goal is nearer than it seems to a faint and faltering man. Often the struggler has given up when he might have captured the victor's cup. And he learned too late when the night slipped down how close he was to the golden crown. Success is failure turned inside out, the silver tint of the clouds of doubt. And you never can tell how close you are. It may be near when it seems afar. So stick to the fight when you're the hardest hit. It's when things seem worst that you mustn't quit. Don't quit, Amen. child of God. Uh, keep on keeping on. Yes. We may be closer to this thing being over than we ever dream. Yep. Keep looking up. Jesus is coming soon. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we love you. Help us, Lord to take to heart that we're not to quit. Help us, Lord, to fight apathy in every false way. 
by maintaining the essential things of our life that you've given us to lean on thine understanding that we might truly be vessels of honor before thee and to this lost and dying world. God, help us to shine as lights in this dark and depressing time and help us to point others to the author and finisher of our faith, the Lord Jesus himself. Now, Father, we know this didn't catch you by surprise. We know that you are in control. You are on the throne. Strengthen us for this wearisome time that, Lord, when the final uh, battle is, the trumpet cry, uh, cry, uh, cry is sounded forth, Lord, we're still in the battle. We're still fighting the good fight of faith and doing what pleases thee. Now, Father, help those that are struggling. Help foes, those that feel like they're being closed in and swallowed up. Help those that are burdensome and, Lord, feel belittled. I pray you would strengthen them, build them up, and encourage them. Lord, increase their faith. Help us these days to not take for granted the privileges of yesterday, but certainly appreciate them, but look forward to the days that we can once again worship you in spirit and in truth. Bless your people. Bless these that came out to help in the service tonight. And Lord, bless your namesake in the days to come, and we'll thank you for it. For it's in Jesus' wonderful and holy name we do ask these things. Amen. 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 Thank you for tuning in. Keep looking up. This too will come to pass, and in those days we'll shout it out, the victory of how great our God is. What a day that's going to be. Could be tomorrow. Keep looking to God. We love you. Thank God for you. And again, keep looking up. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.